Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm very excited today to have my friend on, Arthur Theotis Matthews, J.D., Dr. Arthur Matthews, a university lecturer at institutions such as NYU, the University of Arkansas. He's a bilateral preneur of a firm titled ConsciousTrainers.com with his partner, Evelyn, where he serves as a COO and chief playmaker. I love what he's doing. He collaborates with entities such as government agencies, labor unions, non-for-profit organizations, corporations, and even individuals to assist them in achieving best-in-class outcomes. He earned his Juris Doctorate degree from Howard University School of Law. He's a leadership disruptor, a humble playmaker, lifelong strategic learner. Uh, Arthur, thanks for coming on today. Hey, Derek, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation with you. I appreciate you. You have shared your platform with me multiple times. Uh, you, you've uh, allowed me to, to, to speak over to classes at NYU. Um, you and I have had great conversations. Uh, I consider you a, a like-minded solutions person and, uh, and, and an old soul with me. I feel like uh, uh, when we talk, we could talk for a long time and we're on the same page pretty quickly. And that's fun uh, to be able to meet somebody uh, from somewhere else and just connect that quickly on the same level. Absolutely. I think it was serendipity that we met, Derek. I really mean that. Yeah, I agree with you. I want to give give us a few minutes. So I always like our, our listeners to get to know a little bit more about the the guest that's talking and not just your degree, but just t- give us a background. Like, where are you from? Give us a couple highlights. Like, you can kind of speed through a quick highlight reel about sure. you, and then we'll talk in some key talking points I think are really important for us to go through today. Absolutely. Well, I hail from the Bronx New York and grew up in the projects and single mother. I had a sister who tragically died uh, when I was 21. Uh, And, you know, I kind of lived my life and galvanized my energy through my sister, Cheryl. Uh, Went to college, fortunate to get a football scholarship, played a little college football and was very active in student government early on, which goes back to my sixth grade year where I was sanitation commissioner because I moved from the Bronx, New York to Queens, New York, and I wanted to clean the school. So uh, that was my first elected position, Derek. But I've always been involved with activism. And after college, went to law school uh, with 20 bucks in my pocket and went to the preeminent predominant school for human and civil rights, Howard University School of Law. And I always say it was three of the best years of my life because I met other leaders from all over the country and all over the world, and uh, those three years are still pretty etched in my mind because they were just wonderful years for me, uh, just being in D.C. and and collaborating with a number of different stakeholders. Tell me about your passion for for teaching others, for for investing in others. You, you know, more than anyone else I've ever seen uh, when I talk to students. Uh, the, Young adults who have been students of yours, they light up when they when they talk about you and how in, interested you are in them as a person and helping them grow. And it's one of the highlights and benchmarks of their education. Well, thanks, Derek. You know, I always have said, and I learned this from just really observing and watching in my household, you know, how members of my family, mostly sheroes and heroines, how passionate they were about what they did and I come from a family of healthcare leaders uh, who were very prideful about the kind of passion that they dedicated to their work. And so I always say, if you have a passion for what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And I knew in college and law school that whatever trajectory that uh, you know, I was going to be taken in, that teaching would be part of that. Uh, so I'm just really passionate about students. Uh, whether they're traditional undergraduate students, uh, whether they're grad students, whether they're adult learners. And I've done that for over 30 years now, and that's always been my passion. And here's the thing. 
although I've been a professor at institutions like NYU and Cornell and University of Arkansas, I'm also a lifelong learner. I just love to learn. I love to enroll in workshops and seminars. And now that we're in this digital age, I'm even doing more uh, to learn different platforms, such as you and I are on Skype today. And, you know, I have sessions on WebEx, Microsoft Teams, Zoom. I've used Canvas, Modo, Blackboard, Collaborate Ultra. So I just try to stay on top of my game so that I can communicate across different platforms uh, with my students. You know, you beat me to the punch of saying that you, 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 it's evident that you're a lifelong learner. You have, you have a, an obvious curiosity and, and contagious curiosity um, about learning new things. But there's another thing about you, and you didn't know I was going to say these things, but uh, you have a natural gift, uh, probably as, as much or more than anyone I've ever seen, to, to lift up those around you. You've done that for me personally where you see the good in people and you see their, their heroic possibilities and, and, uh, and really encourage them. And that's just a, that's a natural gift that, that I don't think enough people either have or are aware of that, that I really appreciate. And I think that's one of the things that your students see. Um, and that's a game changer. That kind of injection in somebody's life, especially a young adult, um, can be the secret sauce that they need to believe in themselves and to uh, go explore to what they can do at the highest level. Well, Derek, first of all, thank you so much for the compliment. And it's really simple for me. I've just always felt that I was a servant leader, even before I learned about the concept by Robert Greenleaf. I, you know, those 10 characteristics are just really an embodiment in my DNA. And I feel I'm a playmaker. My role and responsibility is to put people around me in position to make plays. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, tell, talk to me about about Strass. Okay, so thanks, Derek. I appreciate that. <laughs> you and I actually, uh, one of our first conversations, I told you that not only am I excited about my use of metaphors and anecdotes and abbreviations, <laughs> but I have these authorisms, which is an extension of my first name. And it wasn't until I reached 40, which was 22 years ago, I'm 62 years young, that I actually embraced uh, the initials ATM, uh, which are Arthur Theodos Matthews. But Strauss is one of my first, uh, if you will, authorisms that I decided to create, catapult, develop, and spearhead when I was graduating from law school. I had worked on Capitol Hill a little bit, uh, being in Washington, D.C., and I always heard the P word being thrown around. And I don't even use it in a sentence, but I'll give you a famous line from a movie, and everybody will know what it is. Houston, we have a blank. And so I was very intentional and deliberate about saying, you know what? I'm going out into the world. I'm being deputized. I've been influenced by the Honorable Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, who I met unbelievably wow. as the president of the student body, yes, at Howard Law School, and spent 30 minutes with him before he spoke to a group of 1,000. And I just thought, you know what? I'm about to undertake and embark upon this sojourn how can I create some change for, I'm in my mid-20s, how do I create a framework going forward? Strauss is a situation that requires a solution. And I have shared this with my students. I have shared it with my clients. I've shared it with everybody in my orbit to try to get them to think differently about different conflicts that we may face. And so Strauss just means that we embrace it. We don't let it sit there like the P word often does, which sits there and suspends in animation. A situation that requires a solution demands that as leaders, we take action. So it's action oriented. And no one in the Matthews household, Derek, uses the P word. My 16 year old grandson earlier this year said, Grandpa, you got a few minutes. I've got a situation that requires a solution. <laughs> And he's a teenager, Derek. So Sorry. we sat down for 10 minutes. We talked about it. And then together in collaborative fashion, we came up with a solution to his situation. And so it's just a way of reframing. And I have students, Derek, uh, from 20 years ago, 25 years ago, who find me on LinkedIn or, you know, email me and say, Professor Matthews, thank you so much. Strauss has actually been a game changer not only in my professional life, but in my personal life. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. that. That's near and dear to my heart. I never knew how to describe it, but I've always felt that things there there's a solution for everything if it's looked at. And now sometimes it comes at a cost. A lot of things do, but there is a solution. 
And I would encourage my team, you know, don't tell me there's not a solution to just let, let's look and see what options there are. There's usually an option. There uh, is. Right. So, so let's, let's shift a little bit. Um, okay. In light of things happening in the world right now, and we'll, we'll go into detail, but um, I would say this is a time to say uh, Houston, we have a, have a Strauss. That's right. Right. So in, in light right. of, in light of the increased conflict, from police bias towards black and brown Americans. I want to get your take on it. What's your lens and optics of these events? You've, you've been a prosecutor. You've been a, an activist. You have been a leader, a collaborative leader. You've seen it from so many different angles, not just from I one do. side. That's incredible That's to me is and your wife's been a police officer. I mean, all the way around you, your family, you as leaders have seen this from just about every side that it can be seen from. So I can't think of someone more qualified to give a perspective on this because again, Houston, we have a stress. So we do. And, and thank you, Derek, for that. Here's the thing, you know, being that I am in my early sixties, you know, I remember growing up as a kid and, you know, hearing about stories of Emmett Till. I was young enough to remember uh, when John F. Kennedy got assassinated in 63 and then Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And there were so many leaders. And I just uh, felt then that there was this wave of just activism that I really appreciated. But I was really young. But I knew that, you know, in my household, I had these activists who were union members, one for New York City, which was my grandmother, Mimi, and my mother and grandmother, uh, you know, Nana, which is my other grandmother, uh, was a member of the 1199 Healthcare Workers Union. Huh. And so that was the favorite union of Martin Luther King Jr. So for me, uh, you know, first of all, number one, I'm disturbed. Yeah. I'm disturbed by the events, and that's why Evelyn and I have convened with a non for profit I am affiliated with. I'm on the board of advisors. It's the Florence Belsky Foundation. My buddy Dan Snyder, I want to give him a shout out. And what we have tried to do in the last month, we've convened town hall meetings on Zoom to really just have a conversation with a number of stakeholders. And, and here's the thing. Uh, I am just mortified when I hear stories that sometimes you don't hear about Breonna Taylor and you don't hear about the George Floyds. Of course, the difference today, and, and again, you know, my condolences to the, all those families out there, mm. is that now everybody has a mechanism for what I call is demonstrative evidence. And that is an iPhone, an iPad, a smartphone, where they record these events. And I think the thing is this, uh, not all police are bad, we know that, you've heard that, it's cliche at this point. Sure. But he, here's my thing, Derek, and, and, I, and again, yes, looking at it from a lot of different perspectives, there has to be, uh, and I just say it very simply, when we look at the thousands and thousands of police departments, some need to be tweaked, others they need to detonate, implode, vaporize, and eviscerate. Because we need to get to what are the real deep-rooted issues that are happening today uh, in police departments. And then we've got to do a better job of communicating with each other about what's really important, particularly to black and brown individuals. You know, are we still being marginalized? Yes. Are we still being, as Malcolm X said, bamboozled and hoodwinked? Mm -hmm. Yes. So one thing that really gives me a lot of pride is that my partner, Evelyn, and I, we actually are mediators. And so these are the kind of crucial conversations that we love to mediate because there are so many stakeholders at the table. And here's the thing, Derek, and I've said this many times before, we need to negotiate just some ground rules of communication so that people are comfortable talking about these really important issues. And here's the thing, there are multiple stakeholders. We've got the police, you've got the community at large, you've got political entities, and here's the thing, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So what we need to do, wow. get people to the table, let's talk about these issues, let's engage a respectful contrary, because we're not gonna always agree about these kinds of conversations we need to have. You hit, thank you, first of all, for sharing that. And, and again, you, again, the perspective you have, I can't think of a more qualified expert who just has seen all the different sides of this um, and seen the different lens. I mean, yeah, you've got the lens and optics to view this. What's interesting, there are multiple stakeholders. And, and so, you know, as I'm taking notes here, and I've heard so many different sides of it, like we all have, I mean, people 
see their own perspective. And sometimes it's hard to see the bigger picture. That mediation right. is important. But, you know, as you say, multiple stakeholders, it's not a white responsibility. It's not nope. a black responsibility. It, who it is, it is our responsibility to have this conversation. And some of us, right. sometimes we don't know how to even have the conversation. We don't. And, and, and here's the thing. And I really challenge folks that I run across uh, when we are having these conversations. And I say to folks, you know, it's great. Listen, I've been out there with, when I was an activist in college against apartheid. Uh, we helped to enact legislation uh, to create Martin Luther King Day as a national holiday. You know, I've been involved with all those different issues. The question is, there's one part of this conversation that's monolithic. And that is that we're all part of the human condition, to your point, Derek. Hmm. So it affects everyone from a plethora and cornucopia and kaleidoscope of colors, races, creeds, disability, and all the dimensions of diversity. So this is a collective conversation. It really is. And I say to folks, listen, what are you willing to do? Will you be a change initiator? Uh, you know, we featured a few weeks ago a young man who's an artist who uses art form uh, to depict relationships between police and black and brown individuals. He's being a change initiator. So he's sharing through his art form with other individuals that he may or may not know through social media. Uh, are you going to be a change implementer? Will you go to your organization and say, hey, we don't have a policy on diversity and inclusion. We need to implement one. I'd like to be part of that committee. Uh, Will you be a change resistor, which sometimes we have to do in order for things to change? So my thing is, I actually challenge folks to say, don't always rely on other individuals. What can you do individually to change the paradigm of the conversation? Yeah, that's empowering. I, I think I think I'd love to get some more practical tips, too, because, you know, sometimes, you know, so many individuals don't know what to do. Is this the time to listen? Is this the time to take action? What? What should I do? And so you teach courses on leadership and conflict, organizational change, diversity, inclusion, equity. What does an individual do so that they're properly engaged and not a bystander? Like, what does a next step look like? Well, next step is number one, Derek, and this is a really important question that you're asking. All of us need to do a self-reflection. You know, Plato said the beginning is the most important part of any work. And then Socrates said, let he or she who would move the world first move him or herself. So number one, you've got to look at your own vital signs. Huh. You know, what institutional systemic racism is in your DNA? Number one. Number two, how do I engage in a self-reflection about diversity and inclusion and equity? Can I really be truthful to myself? Uh, one example of this is that I occasionally have my students take the Harvard implicit bias test. That's a great way to start. It's a free test. There are 14 that you can take just to find out what possible implicit biases do I have? Guess what, Derek? We all have some. Right. So the way to start is do a self-reflection. You know, we're so always so, you know, articulate about talking about somebody else's lawn, what their gutters and leaders look like. They're falling down, they're chipped. And guess what? We don't look at our own house. Our own house, you walk inside, the paint's peeling. And, you know, there's a uh, walls that need to be plastered. You've got floors that are chipping away. So let's not look at anyone else. Let's look at our own house first before we look at anybody else's house. I talk often about brutal honesty and, and self-reflection and, and, you know, in, a, in masterminds where, where groups challenge each other in that way. I don't know that we've ever challenged each other on this specifically, maybe because it, we didn't even think of it. And it just, it didn't even, it did, until these things are happening that are at least, they've been happening this whole time, but now they're happening in, in a, under a microscope. And it's, I think this is an opportunity for us um, where we've had blind spots to not let that happen. And, and now that we know we can't go back, you can't unknow something. And, we, and, and now it's time, it's our responsibility uh, to do this. That self-reflection is critical. So that's step one. What What's the next? What's something else? Well, the next thing then is to... Surround yourself. You know, one thing that we do that makes us very comfortable, Derek, is that oftentimes we surround ourselves with folks that are like-minded individuals. And you know what? Groupthink is cool every once in a while, but guess what? You know, one thing on my bench right now, and here's the thing. 
I'm a big believer in reciprocal or reverse mentoring. So if you look at my bench, my bench is like the United Nations. Hmm. I don't want folks that are the same generation as me. I don't want folks that are all black and brown. I want different perspectives, different ideologies. That's the only way I'm going to learn and grow as a person. Hmm. So look at your bench. Look who, who's your point guard. Who's your strong forward. Look at who these people are that are on your team to see if you're really looking at life through a prism. And that can be a healthy thing if you do that. Just try it. Don't be so darn resistant. I mean, case in point, you know, you have strong California roots. I'm a New Yorker. You and I met in Middle Earth called Arkansas. <laughs> right. right, Derek? Right. If, if we weren't courageous and curious enough, we would have never ended up with a major presence here. And so part of that for me back in 1997, 98 is I was turning 40. I wanted a new challenge, a new opportunity. There was a chance to help a company that was going through some difficult times. And I, I've always been very employee-centered, if you will. It was a perfect labor management partnership between Levi Strauss and its workers. Hmm. I decided to drive 1,400 miles from New York with my wife and at the time my youngest son. And we planted roots here in Arkansas. And the rest is history. Hmm. You know, sometimes you've got to get out of your own way. And sometimes you can't travel in the left lane all the time. You got to switch lanes. Hmm. Great advice. Self reflection, uh, surrounding yourself with with diverse bench team. Any other any other tips? Any other guidelines there? Well, here's the thing. I would also try to find again mentoring. Traditionally, Derek, you and I are seasoned enough to remember this. Was always about somebody chronologically more seasoned than us giving us advice and providing us teachable and coachable moments. What I would do is be very intentional and deliberate about finding a mentor who has nothing in common with you, nothing in common with you, because that's the way that you'll learn and you can see life through a different optics or a different lens. Hmm. That's powerful. I, I really like that. Hey, we've got a few minutes left. Um, this, I mean, we could talk all day. I could talk to you all day. I want to talk about businesses right now. This is a business leadership series. Um, I'm seeing more and more posts out there. Uh, we haven't talked about this before. Go on LinkedIn, right? Over the last few weeks, you're starting to see all these organizations start to be public and have a discussion and say, we're not sure what it is, but we need to do something. What, what an opportunity right now. There's that word. Um, That's for, right. For us to, to make a positive change in our organization. So with businesses that are looking at, Increased amount of challenges, but also opportunities around race relations and and inclusion and what is you've, your firm, Conscious Trainers, as ConsciousTrainers dot com addresses. Right. The, this is what you already. It's one reason I wanted to talk to you around this subject is this is what you already help companies do uh, before all of this media attention around these tragedies. This is what you're already helping companies do. Tell me more about what that looks like. How, how are you helping businesses, and what does that look like? Well, thanks, Derek. Yeah, and this is what we do in 20 years now that we've taken our transferable skills from industry. You know, Evelyn has a background in psychology. I have a background in law. Uh, we both have worked not only in a corporate environment, but we've also worked in not-for-profits. We've also been union members or union activists. So, you know, our prism is pretty extensive. And what we try to do through ConsciousTrainers.com is increase the awareness of individuals, small groups, and large groups. So through critical thinking, which is the ability to synthesize, analyze, and evaluate, we use case studies. And it's interesting because the case studies that we use are usual actual cases that we've been exposed to, and we just purge the names of the innocent and guilty. Mm -hmm. But these are actually situations that have happened on the shop floor or in the boardrooms or in the conference rooms or at the annual meetings that take place. So we try to raise the conscious level of individuals, you know, through understanding what is implicit bias, what is unconscious bias, what is a microaggression? What does it look like to be an appreciative leader, which is an amazing concept, Derek, hmm. that Dr. Diana Whitney talks about, where she talks about our ability to ask questions. She talks about illumination. She talks about inspiration. She talks about inclusion, and she talks about integrity. So we use those, we use different inventories to really unpack, if you will, the inner sanctum of an individual 
And then really, we don't hit them over the head because that's not really an important way of changing the paradigm of how somebody thinks. Mm -hmm. But we basically have, uh, and, and this is the good thing about it, we not only use inventories and we use substantive lecture, but we use multimedia. And here's something we use that is really effective. Evelyn's a part-time actress. So what we do is we use theater and drama. We call it entertainment, where instead of somebody reading about uh, the latest report from Ohio State University, the Curran Center, uh, which talks a lot about unconscious bias, Evelyn will actually portray three or four different vignettes so people can actually see what it looks like to be on the receiving end of an implicit bias right. or to be a victim of discrimination. Or we may simulate a conversation in front of the water cooler about race, color, creed, national origin, or any of the other dimensions of diversity. So we do things a little bit differently, and we customize everything that we do, Derek. We would never take anything off the shelf. We really understand the vital signs of an organization, and part of that is thinking about this very quickly. When you have a lingering cold, you go to the doctor, the doctor says to you or asks you, what are your symptoms? Huh. Organizations have symptoms. And what we try to do is we try to create a prescription for them that's customized for their culture. Wow. I appreciate you sharing that. I'm thinking of all the, the just the, the benefits. Obviously, it's the right thing. It's a good thing. But to the benefits of improving your culture, your communication, your your workflow, the the quality of work, the diversity of work, and clients. What it's it, it there's it's only upside. It is an upside, and and here's the thing: the mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimension. And those are very prophetic words that Oliver Wendell Holmes uttered. And that's really what we ask people to do, and ask folks to do is just. You know, coming to the training is going to be different from anything you've ever done. And we don't call it a training program, Derek. We call it a process. Okay. So what we'll do is we may have a training intervention, but then we'll follow up with one-on-one -on -one executive coaching with each of the leaders or do it in small groups. And even before we engage in the training, we might do focus groups, surveys, questionnaires, again, to really understand what is the vital signs, what are the vital signs of the organization so we can understand really the dynamics and nuances of how they operate and what the culture's like. I'm, you're probably going to state the obvious, but tell me some of the, just tell me some of the, the case study outcomes that an organization sees when they, when they go through this process. Well, it's interesting you ask that because we've done case studies at different points. You know, we won't wait until the end of a training day we might make sure that there's a case study in the morning after we've given them some content, maybe after going through what the definition is of implicit bias or of the discrimination based on disability. And then what's really interesting is that a lot of times after our training, we see people hugging each other huh. because they have a better understanding of what it is that they didn't know and how it is they may have been reacting and it's important for us to think about the little things. And Helen Keller was one of my favorite sheroes of all time. She said, I long to accomplish a greater noble task, but it is my chief duty to accomplish smaller tasks as if they were great and noble. So the wow. thing is, Derek, just the little things that we do can make a difference. Nobody's expecting you uh, to go to a training session or a training process and go through it and change overnight. It took years, and sometimes what you need to do is you need to just chisel away at some of those biases and assumptions that you had about another individual, and that took a lifetime to develop. You've got to unpack all that stuff, and it's going to be really strategic and tactical about how you do that. Yeah, and, and you know, we're, we're just in the last minute we have here. It's interesting as you share that is, you know, you've got to be willing to do self-reflection and that's the tough work. And a lot of times when I see uh, leaders get jammed or hit a, hit a, a, an upper limit challenge or a cap that they won't get past, it's a lot of times because they're not willing to go uh, and do the deep work uh, looking at themselves first. And that's critical. And that was your number one suggestion. Well, it's not only critical, uh, and this is important, Derek, but here's the thing. The chief stakeholder, the chief C-suite executive, who hopefully is the change initiator, she or he, notice I led with she, mm -hmm. 
she or he needs to make sure that she makes the business case for why there's a ROI. You know, the days of engaging in training, Derek, because it feels good and we can sing Kumbaya and Solidarity Forever. I mean, that's great. But here's the thing. Companies and organizations and individuals are looking for tangible learning outcomes. And that's what we try to uh, provide to our clients. Any any final thoughts you want to share, Arthur? Well, listen, I, I'm, I'm very, very pleased and honored and privileged to be a FOD, a friend of Derek. So <laughs> I'm glad that I am in your orbit, my friend, and you are in mine. How's that? <laughs> I appreciate your Arthurism so much. Uh, I'm honored as well. That's yeah. uh, I want to encourage our listeners, do, do that deep work, those initial things you can do right away, just right now. Uh, self-reflecting, he made a recommendation of the, the Harvard implicit bias test surrounding yourself with a diverse bench, a, a prism to look through, and then mentoring right. or a mentor that has nothing in common with you that you can learn from. And then with your business in leadership, uh, I encourage you to visit ConsciousTrainers.com, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, Arthur, thank you again for being uh, uh, my guest today, and I look forward to seeing the next great things that you do and the, the next change that you create. Hey, Derek, I appreciate you, my brother. You take good care of yourself and pace yourself. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Okay, thanks, Derek. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. 